Hey everybody, welcome to today's episode of the Empire's Builders Podcasts, Mastercasts, all the casts, live streaming. We're everywhere. We're on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and we have Miss Karen Hunsanger with us today. How are you, Karen? I'm good. Hi there, everybody. Thank you for having me. Look at this, right? You guys didn't expect this. We had a uh, we had a, a a a slight twist, a plot twist for you guys today. And we were able to get Karen Hunsinger on to talk about becoming an editor. And we'll talk about other things too. EBM. Honoré is not here to defend herself, so we'll talk about her. Of course. All the things. So All how are you doing things. today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. And you've been uh, face down editing and writing and doing all the things. I am. You know, I, um, I'm having a very busy time and I'm thankful for that because uh, I'm so busy right now that I am now booking December. Ooh, look so, at that. And they're all uh, repeat and referrals. And I'm very grateful for those. And I thank you, everybody who has sent them my way. I'm so appreciative. Oh, that's excellent. Um, I guess this is a good time to tell you I need to get on your calendar for early next year. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a good idea to do that now. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put my next nonfiction book out sometime early half of next year. Um, and I, I better get on that calendar before it gets booked up. That's right. So um, are you allowed to talk about uh, some of your more recent projects you've been working? Are there any sure. that you can... A few of them. I don't have to mention names, but I, but uh, the one that I was knee deep into this morning, um, I'm working on a children's book with uh, an author who has his two young daughters helping him. And it's way cute. I mean, I get to interview these, these kids and, um, and I'm really kind of book doctoring this one because he wrote the initial manuscript and it was, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> It's, it's all good. It was textbook like, and I thought that's not that's not really conducive for a children's book. So um, I'm writing a story in into his manuscript. So I'm book doctoring. I'm doing a little bit of ghostwriting. I'm doing a little bit of editing, and uh, it's about money. It's about finance, and I think it's really good for kids. And his daughters, who are 15 and nine, I believe they are, uh, are helping. Wow. Yeah. So. So they've, they've given me a lot of kid talk to, to incorporate into my stories. And uh, it's really fun. They're just very cute. So, so that's my, my fun project right now. I was going to ask what kind of contribution the girls, are, are they both girls, the daughters? The, well, both girls, yes. What, what kind of contributions are they making to the, to the book? They are making significant com contributions because when I get them on Zoom, um, I'm asking them to react to like different scenarios. What would you do if your teacher said this? And what would happen if this happened? And, you know, show me your facial expression so I can see how you would react. And what would you say in this situation? And so they're contributing quite a bit. Oh, that's great. So yeah, I guess, in, so that's a lot of book doctoring, right? That's also like a lot of kind of developmental editing on your side, right? Behind the scenes after you've had those conversations. Yeah, book doctoring is a combination of ghost writing and uh, developmental editing. It's, uh, it's kind of right between the two of them. There's a, a line there. And it's really my most fun projects. It's the one that, that, I, that I enjoy the most. So I'm really liking this one. Is that with or without transcripts? <laughs> Not everybody gives me transcripts, Lucas. <laughs> uh... out. He actually had a, a written manuscript albeit um, a little bit rough, especially nice. for a kid's book. But sure. that's okay. That's what he hired me for. Yep. Yep. That's what, and, and I actually think that's, uh, I mean, before I got into um, writing books, I was always concerned that uh, you'd have to have this really polished thing before you ever got to an editor. And I mean, obviously the, the, the process of writing that many words and putting all that stuff together and working in that document day after day, it starts to, you know, you start to get, I don't want to say tunnel vision, but you're kind of trapped in the pages to a certain degree. And you just have to realize like, now you really need that editor to help you in those situations. And you don't have to worry about being perfect. Um, they're there to help guide you where you're falling off. So um, I love it. I love having that relationship with a developmental editor and with a, with a good book coach. 
Well, that's the beauty of having an editor. You can relax a little bit because you know somebody's got your back, hmm. especially if you're working with a developmental editor, which is one of my most favorite things to do. So if you're stuck uh, and you're at a point where, oh, I just can't look at this anymore, or I could keep writing forever, um, then it gets sent my way and I help you relax and kind of take over the reins a little bit and we, we go back and forth a little bit and that's okay. Yeah. This is uh this is a really interesting segue into uh, the conversation of writers not only working with editors and proofreaders, but becoming editors and proofreaders. And I feel like, I don't know why I assumed this, but I used to assume that they were not uh, in one path than the other, but obviously that, you know, it's logical that people usually are writers before they're editors in some way, shape or form, whether they ever publish or not, whether they ever get into um, into doing it, uh, professionally, uh, writing professionally. There are a lot of people that start out as writers and then they see editing and proofreading as a way to e expand their revenue streams in their career, um, in fiction and nonfiction. And I love that because I was just talking to a young aspiring author. I don't know. He was probably 19, 20, well, he's 20, 21 years old. And he's like, yeah, I can't make any money writing. And I'm still trying to figure out what kind of writer I want to be. And I'm like, didn't you just tell me you edited the school newspaper for two and a half years? Right. He's like, yeah. I'm like, have you thought about doing some editing to bring in some, some money in addition to the writing? It might be a nice change of pace and a way for you to still work with written work and do all the things. And he was like, oh, it's a great idea. And I'm thinking, yeah, man, if you're really good at it, you're going to have more work than you know what to do with because people love holding on to a good editor. Um, are you seeing or have you seen in your, your career as an editor a lot of people transition from writing to editing? Well, first of all, it's exactly what happened to me because I didn't start out thinking that I was ever going to be an editor. That was not... Uh, that was not the first thing that came to my mind. I, I, my book was kind of a passion project. I did it after um, I retired. And after I published that book, then I started getting people, you know, all of my friends, you know, different authors coming to me and saying, hey, you know, you did an okay job on this. Do you think you could help me do mine? And I did that first one and found out that I really loved helping people find the words when they were lost mm. or, you know, when they, they kind of uh, made minor errors or whatever to help them to get over that, help them shine. It was just really, really fun. I didn't need to be on the forefront. I just wanted to help them to get where they wanted to go. And, and it's actually the number one question that I get now is how, how do I become an editor? Because mm. my first year, um, because I'm in the right group and know a lot of the right people um, was pretty, pretty darn successful for year one. And so people flock to me and want to know, how did you do that? You know, how, how is it that, that you went from being a writer to an editor all of a sudden, and, and you've got all of this business. And so I started teaching people. I started mentoring some people. Um, I've got a few, few people out there that I'm mentoring right now. And it just, it, um, it really pleases me. I really enjoy that. I enjoy seeing um, other people flourish and do what they want to do. Now, not all of them are writers. I would say if you want to be a developmental editor, you really must have been a writer or you must be pretty gifted at writing because it takes a lot of writing to do that. Um, a copy editor, a proofreader, those are mostly grammar, grammar gurus, you know, people who um, just got the A's in grammar and are, are just like really passionate about finding punctuation and spelling errors. Well, that's not really me. I can do it, but I prefer to, um, to really get into the content. And uh, what I did is I developed a test for people that I haven't even published yet that I'm going to put out there uh, for some students, some past students of mine. Um, to help them determine which editor they are really a good fit for, what their skills and what their attributes, uh, what direction that points them into. So, and so they can tell the difference because people are confused about the difference. Yeah. In editors. Yeah. yeah I, I, I was, I, I mean, I openly admit to, you know, I thought 
there was just one type of editor. <laughs> Everybody does. It's like, Everybody does. You know, and then Honoré's like, sit down, sit down, young one. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, ma'am. She's like, let me explain how all this works. And I'm like, oh, like I, I and I thought a proofreader was another editor going behind an editor, you know, just to have two sets of eyes on the document. And sometimes, you know, well, often it kind of it kind of is in a way. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But they have different purposes, you know, they do. And I, and I think that was where I was kind of confused. Um, I do want to take just one break from the conversation to say hello to Renee, who's saying hi to us. Hi, Renee. Renee. Hello, Renee. She is constant, constant, consistently supportive of the show. Renee, thank you so much for joining us again today. You She's can help me. Yeah, you can help us harass Honoré over message. Yeah. Yeah, we would enjoy that. <laughs> and then we have Kellen Ann. Hello, Kellen. Ann, how are we? Hello. Hello. Yes, calling for Facebook. So we have Facebook, YouTube reps. Um, we're gonna get a we're gonna get a LinkedIn next. It's just gonna happen. That's what's gonna have to happen. Um, so when we when we talk about um, Oh, I'm, <laughs> All right, I'm going to share this on the screen. <laughs> Renee's the, she's definitely up for harassing Honoré, which is good. Good, good job. Yeah. I, I, I didn't talk much about it at the beginning of the show, but Honoré is unable to be with us today. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why we're all rooting to harass her. Um, it's a busy time of year, but um, anyway, um, with, with the pat, like, so if let's say I was a writer that wanted to become an editor, um, I wouldn't know where to start. I wouldn't know where I would probably go to an editor that I know and say, Hey, like, what does this look like? How do I get from point A to point B? Did the, the, the exam or quiz or test or survey that you created that helps people understand where their skills are and where they're probably wanting to go. Um, is that available through your program? Do you, is that a part of your structured program? It will be part of my book. Um, and, uh, I am actually sending it out to people who request it. If you Excellent. email me, I will send it to you um, because I'm curious to find out what people think of number one, the quiz itself, and number two, where they fit in. It's mm. really interesting to find out uh, what people enjoy doing and what their skill levels are. And I'm always looking for good uh, proofreader and copy editors because I, I include some of that within my services. So it's nice to have that second set of eyes and somebody that I can hire um, to help me do that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, so anyone can, can request that um, yes. survey from you. That's excellent. Um, yeah. And then, so like, if I take that survey and it tells me, um, does it, t like you had mentioned that it might show me where my strengths are. Right? Yes. Do you drive people down those strengths first? Is there like, what's on the back side of the survey? Well, you know, it, it's up to them to reach out to me or somebody else after that point. It, you know, what you said in the very beginning is absolutely correct. You said that you would contact an editor that you know. Hmm. Well, that's absolutely what you do. Uh, anytime you want to learn how to do something, you get a hold of somebody who's doing what you want to do right. and learn from them. And a lot of times uh, they can send you to different programs or uh, to other people, to different courses um, and things to learn, different books. There's a, hmm. There are a lot of books to help people. And I'm in the middle of writing one. So... Um, I'm going to be getting that out at the beginning of the year okay. uh, to help people further because I get this question so much that I really wanted to give people a place to go. Oh, that's excellent. And you, and you, so just for people that maybe aren't familiar, you're writing the book about this, which will come out in the beginning of the year, but you also have, um, like a, like a, like a group coaching kind of program for, for editors, right? I did. I did a little four week uh, mini beta course because I wanted to, to use it, honestly, uh, not only to help people, but it helped me finish my book. Mm -hmm. And it also helped me uh, construct the quiz, the quiz that I have done out there now. So, um, God bless Is Rogue there? I love my dog. <laughs> well, he, obviously, there's a serial killer at the door. So well, so we'll and, try and to ignore him. Yeah, well, we are friends of, of pets on the show. Like I was just doing a podcast interview with a friend of mine uh, earlier in the week and her cat was in her lap meowing and her oh. dog was in the next room barking at the cat. 
Okay. And I was cracking up. I'm like, you're you're in the sandwich right now. You're like literally trapped between two animals that want to share their opinions with you, right? Right. right well, show. apparently he has something to say about what I'm saying right now. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was a big fan Andy. of the beta. His name is Andy, and he's a beautiful golden retriever, and I love him to the moon. He's yeah. my boy. Andy's but, a sweet dog. Yeah. So I ran a um, a little mini course for mm -hmm. about four weeks and got a lot of input from a lot of really talented, curious people. And it was very fun. Um, I don't have one going currently, but I'm going to be doing another one. It was, it was pretty successful. And in fact, the biggest feedback that I got at the end was, could you please make this longer? It just wasn't, it wasn't long enough. And I thought, oh, okay, oh. Well, that's, there's nothing wrong with that comment, so. Wow, and you so, may have already stated it and I might've missed it. Um, how long was your program? The first one was only four weeks, hmm. yeah. you know, because I thought that I could, I could cover everything in four weeks, which I did, but they thought it was a little fast. They wanted, they wanted more, they wanted more practice time, a little bit more feedback. Right. And uh, I will do that again, probably in October. Excellent. Uh Oh, we've got Wayne in Egypt. Really? Yeah. Hi, Wayne. Hey, Wayne. How's it going, shipmate? I see the little camel there. That's that's pretty cute. Yeah, he is in Egypt. Um, Wayne helps um, with the uh, ship repair and shipbuilding and uh, naval assets. I can I can say that. <laughs> okay, um, I'm I'm completely impressed. Actually. Yeah, yeah. He was a he was a shipmate of mine back in the Coast Guard, and um, and then obviously we've we've stayed close since, and we've worked together on a few things um, post both of our retirements. So I'm, imp I'm impressed that you both survived, <laughs> survived working with me. <laughs> yes. I'm kind of right between the lines there. That's very good. Lucas. Well, you've survived working with me at least <laughs> twice. So <laughs> I enjoyed working with you. Oh, well, thank you. I For enjoyed anybody who, with you too. who doesn't know, you are an absolutely amazing, incredible, talented writer. And I know you're rolling your eyes at that, but you are. Well, thank you. So and, much. and I got a little teeny taste of the fiction that you have coming out and, it's just absolutely brilliant. That's so nice of you to say. Thank you. I mean, you know how you know how good I am at taking compliments. I know you don't like it. That's why I'm pushing. It's, it, there's nothing more fun than to see you turn red. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you've seen me turn red a few times. Like, uh, uh, what was um, were we at the EBM meeting and we were all messing around and I was giving you a hard time at the table and then you got me back and I was like. <laughs> I don't remember, but it sounds it sounds kind of typical. Yeah, that we would banter back and forth a little. So, for those that aren't familiar with the Empire Builders uh, Master Class, which is not to be confused with the Empire Builders Master Mind, right? The Master Mind is where uh, Karen and I met. We're both um, have the fortune of having Honoré as our mentor in that program, and of course, she's just fantastic at picking people that would get along and and work well together um so there i am sitting next to karen and i'm like yeah i'm gonna need an editor and she's like i do editing and i was like awesome and she jumps in and just becomes way more than an editor uh just literally like the linchpin to my to my progress in that book as i was writing monetize your book of the course i really needed that uh relationship and i think that that's a really strong reason to work with someone like you to learn how to become an editor because i've worked with editors before in different capacities that were shocked that we actually met face to face you know i'm like hey do we get on zoom together sometime soon they're like oh i don't usually do that but we can if you <laughs> need to and i'm like okay um same with uh with uh proofreaders um, and, and there's just this, there's very different ways that the services are rendered in the industry, not saying one way is better or than the other or right or wrong, just saying there are different types of relationships um, between writers and editors, writers and proofreaders out there. And yours was exactly what I needed to make my, my nonfiction book move forward. So much so and so great at it that I was like immediately bludgeoned you with the second manuscript. <laughs> 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 so, well, I like being busy, and and you know it's funny because uh, within our uh, EBM uh, mastermind group, um, there are a handful of people that I've worked with. Now I've been really fortunate, and face to face is nice, isn't it? When you get to yeah. meet the people that you're going to work with, 
Right. And uh, I even face to face a lot of times with the people that I don't know personally. I like to jump on Zoom. I on the phone with them, and I think that that personal relationship is critical. It's, right. it's just so important to uh, doing the best job that you can for people. Yeah, I mean, to understand the writer a bit, to understand their voice, not like their audible voice, but their written voice, to understand their goals, orientation, all the things. I think you really have to have that conversation. I'm not saying you got to be like talking to each other every night for an hour. I'm just saying like you do have to get familiar enough with your clients that you can do that. And I would imagine, I'm asking you because you're the expert here, but I would imagine the more you get away from strict copy editing um, or strict uh, proofreading and you move more toward book coaching and book doctoring and all those things, that is obviously scales up, right? The interaction between the client and the uh, provider uh, scales up, right? So is there a big difference for in, like if you had to recommend someone choosing to take one route before the other, would you recommend them exploring the fundamentals of copy editing and proofreading first? Well, there's a huge difference. Uh, you're right about that. And that's where my quiz comes in. If you take my quiz, uh, copy editors and proofreaders mostly have a tendency to be left alone. Hmm. They, they want to be, they like working on their own. They don't need to have um, that one-on-one -on -one, uh, development. There's emails that go back and forth, obviously, but their work usually comes from um, somebody who's been through the developmental editor or book doctor or book coach process and those people um, the book doctor book coach uh, developmental editor those people require uh, a little bit more one-on-one -on -one relationship kind of things hmm. um, because the first thing that you need to know is what is the the client's purpose for their book what does that author want to do with this book hmm. i mean are they going to use it as a marketing tool are they going to, is it just a passion project and they really don't care about the marketing part of it? Because I like to go the extra mile in that role and help them with their front matter and their back matter. And if they're a first time author, they don't know about those things. Mm -hmm. So the more that you can help them and guide them, the, the more successful they're going to be, um, the more happy they're going to be with your service. And um, I'm just very service oriented. I want that author to shine it is everything I've got to get them to look good. That's my job. I love that. And and your your um your your point about front and back matter being different in that situation is in that case you're you're helping them develop those things and exposing them to new ways to leverage their book for a, a marketing and representation of a business and those types of things, right? Is that what you mean by that? Absolutely. You know, like for instance in the back matter where the where you would typically find the author bio well, they want to mention um, their company, their firm, their emails, their contacts, uh, especially if they're wanting to use it as a, a marketing tool. Um, and sometimes an author of a, of a different or kind of project, rather, uh, is not as concerned about that. Um, right. Front matter being um, a lot of times, you know, do they want do they want a dedication? Do they want to put a special invitation in the front to direct people to their uh, social media? all kinds of different things that you can help an author with when it's their first time, they're just not aware. Right. Now, for those that don't understand the value of having this period in the beginning, um, in the first half of the book, in my humble opinion, of working very closely with a book coach or, or a book doctor um, to make sure that you're, you're building the right book and thing to serve the right audience and to serve your business the right way. Um, a, a great example of that would be when you and I first started working on my first book, we weren't even working on the book that got published, no. right? Like we shifted right. gears um, because you and I had a good conversation where I said, hey, um, I think I might be writing the wrong book. It's the right book, but it's the wrong book, right? It's like, it's going to be a good book, but it's not the right book for who I'm serving. And what it what my business really needs right now my business drivers my goals for my business aren't necessarily aligned to this book project i started two years ago having you there to talk through with that was huge for me because i wouldn't have had the confidence to shift having invested that much time in in that book up to that point without having someone to lean on that i knew i could trust that had had uh clear eyes 
that wasn't emotionally involved in, you know, the business, if you will, but was emotionally concerned for the business, right? Like you're, you, you really want your clients to succeed, but it's, it's also, you know, they're going to feel different about it because it's their business. Um, that was huge having that kind of relationship with you because we left that one conversation saying, yep, you know what, we're, <laughs> this needs to change. We need to shift gears and put this other book out. And that set us on a path for another six months that was totally different than the original path. So um, is there a perspective on that experience? Well, it's funny because I remember those early conversations and you being the kind and thoughtful person that you were, you, you didn't want to, I think you felt like you might be wasting my time in the very beginning. And you were like, <laughs> I don't know if this is the right thing. And you're kind of tiptoeing around a little bit with, you know, I was considering this and I'm like, Oh, heck yeah. I'm like the bull in the china closet. Yeah, let's dump that puppy. And let's go forward with, let's go forward with what you want to do. And the thing is, look at how it set you up. Yeah. Look at, look at where it put you. You knew what you needed to do. You knew where you needed to go. And you've done how many books since then? Yeah, you got that. It was this one. Yeah. This is what you ended up with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and if we then, hadn't had that conversation, this book wouldn't be here. Yeah, but but we did, and you moved forward, and you right. have your courses, and you've got an, another one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you just took yourself in a totally different direction, and it was, it was it was fun to watch. Well, thank you. It was uh, I, I I needed that um, relationship, and it was so valuable to me as um, a new author that I was um, hundred percent committed to having someone in that role on every book I ever work on ever again. I'll never not do a book um, where, or I'll never do a book where I don't have that relationship with an editor of some, some caliber in the, the, the book doctoring or developmental editing kind of thing. Um, because it was so critical to the development of that book that it just like cemented my, my faith in that relationship immediately. Um, we took that same uh, production style and relationship and rolled it into this second book. And I didn't really take a lot of time off between publishing the first one and, and starting the, the writing process for the second one. And knowing that I had you there to support me when I was juggling book marketing and writing another book and conceptualizing the second book. Uh, made me feel like I could do both. If I didn't have that relationship, I couldn't, I wouldn't have been comfortable doing both. So uh, another check in the box for having the right type of editing relationship and the right type of coaching relationship is that it gives you the ability to be more productive even when you have overlapping projects, especially when you have overlapping projects than you would be if you were on your own. So I, I just feel like the investment's worth it every day um, that you're you're doing that. Well, good. I um, I remember getting that second one from you. And, you know, you're so busy. And <laughs> most authors are. Everybody who's mm -hmm. running a business is, is, have got their hands full. Yeah. And so you transcribed a lot of that. But fortunately for me, you're such a good speaker that you speak almost the same way you write. And that was really easy for me to convert that. And that was a fun job to do. But and oh, I think thank that, you. Yeah, I think it made us a pretty good team because you really needed to to uh, grab back some of your time for other things. And I was able to kind of relieve some of that pressure for you. And I was really happy to do that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Um, and, and there's there's uh, there's more. So the relationship part of that is important, right? Because you can as the person creating content, you can collaborate with that person um, on the other side of the table and say, how can I, how can I do this in a way that you can, you find it useful, right? right? That we can meet these. And when you're speaking the same language and have an experience with somebody already, that conversation happens fairly quickly. So this is a, this is a, a note to people out there that may not have had that kind of relationship with their first book, maybe even their second or third book. And they're still seeking that. Um, it gives you a bit of a standard with which to com to compare, right? Like, Hey, I can I can work with someone at that level. Yes, you can. The force multiplier is not the stuff that's written on most articles. Oh, there's Jen. Jen Pisano. Hi, Jen. Tuned in for the second half. Hey, Jen. Good Excellent. To see her. She's yeah. Such, she's such a good girl. We love yeah. Jen. Yes, and Jen just did some proofreading on my fiction book. 
Jen is one of uh, one of my students from my first class and uh, one of my mentees, and she is fabulous. She is going to be um, very, very good. She will be somebody everyone will want to reach out to at some point in time. So good to work with. Um, mm -hmm. It was funny Easy. getting messages from her in, in the middle of her. She's like, dude, <laughs> this scene has got me on edge. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, all right, great. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> That's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. Story's being told right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe made, made me because, you know, when you send your work off to an editor and it's silent, you're like, I hope they think it's okay. Is it total now, garbage? You know, yeah. now that now you brought up a really interesting point in the difference between a nonfiction and a fiction, mm. um, because they are different. Oh yeah. And a developmental editor that's good for a nonfiction is not necessarily good for a fiction. That's true. However, a copy editor and a proofreader can do either, relatively easy because those those people are just thinking about the mechanics. Mm. So. Uh, Jen, who is accustomed to more nonfiction, really did a great job on your uh, on your fiction because she was really looking for the mechanical errors and you needed somebody to come in and fine tune that for you. Absolutely. Um, I, that to, to me uh, is non-negotiable to have a proofreader. Right. I know a lot of, I know a lot of authors, they'll, they'll have an editor and they'll have a really good relationship with an editor and they don't move to proofing or they'll replace that proofing with a beta group um, which I think is a, is a hazard personally, I agree. um, because I, I'm, well, one, the beta group may not be at the level of, of, uh, of competency and skill that you need them to be at to serve that purpose. And uh, second, they may not feel comfortable bringing these things to your attention. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Jen. Um, Jen was great in all those fronts because, uh, and, and I could obviously tell that she had worked with you on, on some of this because, uh, in areas of the of the manuscript where she wanted me to consider things, she was good about putting notes in and walking me through the thought process. Maybe something I say in my head and when I, I write means something different than what everyone else reading it will will see, right? So it makes me stop and go, oh, wait, you know what? They're right. I'm confusing people with this. Or, oh, wow, this could be better. Like I didn't even, I walked right by that line when I wrote it and didn't even see the power of it. And the reader's grabbing it and going, oh, man, look at this. And it might be an opportunity to, to really throw some color in there. So working, working, with, working with you, Jen, was great. <laughs> Talking like she's not here. <laughs> yeah, she, she's fabulous. She's just, just a good human. She's just so lovable. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, some people will question, well, why do I need a copy editor or a proofreader after I've had a developmental editor or a line editor? can't why can't they do do it all and a lot of times when you're doing a line edit and a copy or a developmental edit you'll catch those mistakes if you see them but that's not your concentration you are really looking hard at the content and a lot of times you'll miss the little things because you are trying to do something totally different so to expect that from your developmental editor or your line editor and expect them to be perfect is not reasonable um, they will try to as much as they can, but there always, always needs to be a proofreader at the very minimum that comes in behind uh, any editor. You've got to do that last step or there's going to be things that get missed. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it's fantastic advice for for first time authors and for anyone who's been writing. Any, if you're not, any not currently doing that. You really need to to think that through. It's it's uh, it's critical. Um, so. Tell me a little bit about what the process looks like of becoming an editor. So like, let's say I, I come to someone like you who's uh, established and can identify my strengths and my weaknesses and help me work on those. Is, is the, what's the timeline like normally? I know this isn't for everybody because everyone's different, um, but what does the experience normally look like regardless of the time? Like, how do you walk into this world? Well, you know, you you kind of you kind of hit the nail on the head when you when you said it's different for everybody because it depends on your skill level. Mm. Um, there are people who are very talented writers, um, have read all their lives, have written all their lives, who can walk into a developmental editing job and it just comes natural for them. Now they still need training, um, but there's the earlier, you know, the younger person who is just thinking about it that needs to take a quiz, that needs to find out what their skill levels are, 
that needs to talk to other editors and find out what paths they took, more than one, because everybody's different. And then I always direct them to number one groups. Networking is, is gold. You, you cannot be networking with a writer's group or an author's group um, and not for the intention of finding clients from the beginning. It's just networking, just talking to people, building relationships. Building relationships is the number one most important thing you can do, uh, bar none. And once you start building those relationships and you start talking about what you do, um, what your specialties are, uh, what you're, you know, what you're working on, then people start to want to try you out. Then they're, oh, okay, I have a relationship. I like, know, and trust this person now. Um, maybe I would like to consider using them on my book. Now, in addition to that, in to, addition to networking, I always say, take some courses, go out on the internet and find some, some places where you can learn things and you can learn things um, for free a lot of times. Uh, Chicago Manual of Style has got a lot of quizzes out on their website that you can take and learn um, what some of their standards are, for instance. And that, that is really helpful. Um, and once you do those two things and you're networking and you do get that first, uh, first bite, then I say, do a couple of things for free. Hmm. You know, do, do a friend's blog do your first manuscript and don't charge for that um, and learn from the process and show people what you can do. And then even after that, once you're established and you're starting to get paid gigs, you do samples. You find out from the author if you are a good fit for them and they are a good fit for you. You know what your skill level is, their skill level is and they know what yours is. And I always do um, a couple thousand words as a sample for people just to see what it is I'm working with. And I can't really price a, a manuscript until I see it anyway. Mm. Um, and then they know whether they like me and I know whether I like them and mm. you kind of go from there. I really love that part um, because I, I don't, I mean, you know, there's a traditional approach to X amount per word, right? Like it's in that it's a word count math problem, you know, and that's, a, you know, the writers are often thinking, yeah, how much, you know, what's your rate? Um, but there's so much more to it than that because the amount of effort that goes into 2,000 well-written words versus 2,000 poorly written, word, written words is very different. Right. Right. Um, and so, yeah, even though the rate may not change if you offer a fixed rate type of service, um, although I probably <laughs> would have a different rate <laughs> in that situation. <laughs> Man, this looks like this is going to hurt. My rate's a little different. <laughs> It's like, that's a joke. I don't know who, some people might actually do that. I'm, I probably would, <laughs> but you know, if it's, um, if you're looking at that kind of work, you really have to see enough of it and, uh, get a grasp of, of the totality of that writing, um, in a, in a, in a big enough sample size to be able to accurately predict how much effort it's going to take to, to edit that work. That's well, you know, it's, it's like you mentioned, all authors are at different skill levels. All editors are at different skill levels, too. So to have that sample, um, I always have to have a sample before I can come up with my price. And I do price them differently. A new editor will nine and a half times out of ten uh, have, have a higher price than somebody who is experienced and, you know, have, have been around the block a few times um, because there's just so much more to do with a new editor. Um, but I always give them the very best service too. Those mm. are, I, I specialize almost in new editor, new authors because they're the ones that need the most help. So, um, right. yeah. So it's, it's critical to, to do that sample. Look who we've got here. Oh, is that Miss Honore? <laughs> yes. Well, we can't talk about her anymore now because she's listening. <laughs> We talked all about you. Well, she was probably listening. <laughs> yeah, she probably was. Um, we have nothing but love to send your way anyway. We adore you and hope to see you soon. Yeah, I hope you're hope you're ready to rock and roll. We've got we've got some some FaceTime actually happening soon. I'm really excited. And that, that includes you as well. I will be seeing you soon. Miss Karen. Right. I'm going to see you this next week. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, great. We're going to be at an event together, and that's going to be really fun. Yeah. 
yeah, looking forward to that. And we can talk about that next editing project. <laughs> It'll be part of the discussion. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll bring my I'll bring my uh, calendar book with me. Yeah, do that. You might want to. Yeah, you might want to bring that with you, just for at least like uh, you know, so you can gauge how much pain you want when. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've gotten to where I where I carry it with me almost everywhere I go anyway, because uh, yeah, I just I never know who I'm going to bump into or who's going to call. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Wayne. We hope you have a safe one over there, buddy. Hey, thank you, Wayne. Um. Yeah. So so let's let's see. So let's. Let's let's dive just a little bit more into the life of an editor, right? Because I feel like a lot of this looks good on the outside to writers. They're like, <laughs> well, I love to read, you know? Yeah, yeah. Clearly, I'd love to just get paid to read. Right. That's, I mean, how much work is there here? Like, you know, and it's like, well, um, yes. <laughs> the concentration <laughs> level alone is intense. I mean, it's, it's you intense. really have to slow down, right? I mean, you really do. You have to be. And, you know, I'm a crazy person. The hours that I work, people people don't want to work what I do. I don't know. But it works well for it me. Is, but it's the most quiet time. I'm up in the middle of the night a lot of times, you know, yeah. two, three in the morning working on manuscripts and nobody's going to call you. So <laughs> I've got uninterrupted time and I'm more fresh that time of day than I am any other time anyway. So I can do a lot of hours of work when I begin there. And my days are long. My days are long, but that's because I choose them to be. So there are a lot of editors who can do it, do the job part time and just, you know, filter in their jobs when it's comfortable for them to do so and spend fewer hours than I do. But I, I think I'm a little bit of a an aberration. I am kind of a, a maniac when it comes to working hours, but I don't have to, I want to. I'm retired and it's what I love to do. Um, and anybody else who's considering being an editor, if it's something that you really love, you're gonna make your own hours. You're gonna find your own way. You're gonna figure out what works for you and uh, you're gonna make it work if that's what you really want to do. Well, I, I like that you brought up the fact that you're retired from your corporate career yes, yes. Um, and working full time as an editor, but you have flexibility because it is your business and it's your work and you get to choose the volume with which you take on um, the, the clients that you um, that you have available to, you know, that are interested in working with you. You get to choose the clients and the wins. Um, and I think that's really liberating and powerful, especially since a lot of people watching this are trying to build an empire of their own and they're maybe learning what options they have available to them. Um, I, I, I feel like, and you can, you can tell me if I'm crazy here, but I feel like your approach to picking the times that work best for you, not only make your job more enjoyable, but they also make your productivity better, right? Like, I don't want to make it sound like you couldn't be productive outside of those bounds, but you have the freedom to construct those times with which you're working. Uh, you're not clocking in on someone else's clocks. I think this is great for like stay at home moms or people that work from home, um, writers who are trying to get a full time writer career going and they're looking to fill in the blanks. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of opportunity to have a flexible option here to make some money and do something you love uh, and, and not be beholden to someone else. Cause I think, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, this whole, I'm not getting as much royalties off my books. Um, or I'm not making as many sales as I wish I was, or I'm not serving as many clients as I wish I was. That's it. I got to go file for a nine to five. You know, they're just like automatically default to that. And I would think it'd be easier to, to uh, maybe not easier, but maybe more enjoyable to step into something like this, where you maintain your flexibility and have more options. Well, you know, it's completely individual uh, for me personally, because I'm retired from my nine to five for about four years now. I mean, mm -hmm. my biggest concern is how many treats my dog needs in the day and, you know, what I'm going to feed my husband when he comes <laughs> home because, dang it, he's hungry every day, every single day that that just happens. never stops eating. It just <laughs> never does. So, um, but, you know, it's like anything else. I, I remember when I was working, if there was something that I really wanted to do, when did I fit it in? Hmm. I fit it in just because I really wanted to. And there are ways that that anybody can do this if it's if their heart is really into it. And it's it's 
one of those fun things that you can definitely choose your own hours. I mean, put the kids to bed and work for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, work for an hour before the kids get up and you have to deal with lunches and what have you. And a lot of times the, the, the moms have send their kids off to school and get an hour here or an hour there, um, especially for a proofreading job. That's really beneficial, uh, really fits well with that kind of a job. A developmental editor, it's a little bit more difficult because it takes some very heavy concentration. But yes, you absolutely, as um, a mom, even a single mom, you can absolutely do this job. And single dads and, and guys who are trying to uh, get out of their corporate jobs, you know, forever and, and try to skate into something that they would love to do and like a, a lot better than what they're doing now. There's, there are ways to do it because it's so flexible. Right. And I, and I love that you can use it as a cha change of pace kind of option as mm -hmm. well. So, right. You know, it's different writing than it is proofreading and editing. Yes. And uh, I mean, the last couple of weeks, my brain's been like, because of yeah. you know, <laughs> finishing two books and the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to read someone else's words. <laughs> Right. Yeah, like right. A little bit of a palate cleanser and a break away from looking at the same uh, documents that I've been looking at, uh, whether they be nonfiction, fiction books, blog articles, whatever, when it's all you all the time and you're generating all this material, it's nice to have an option to break away from your own work and do the same type of work with someone else's words, someone else's voice, even a completely different genre than you write in. Um, it could be a really nice way to kind of have that gear shift without having to completely depart the pattern and go do something wildly different. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the, uh, the variation that you get doing what I do, you know, people ask, what are you reading? And I'm, I'm reading a lot of things because I'm reading everybody else's work, mm. but, but talking about jumping from genre to genre, I, I, uh, typically do nonfiction self-help. Uh, but lately I got, a romance and it was actually uh, more of a fiction than a nonfiction. It was based on a true story, but there was some steamy parts in there. And, <laughs> and I was a little embarrassed, honestly. but, but I got through it and, and you know, the, it, the whole story wasn't that way. And in fact, she was very, very good, very talented writer. And Oh, Jen, that's going to be coming your way here pretty soon to uh -huh. my dear. So um, yeah, it's, it's, got its level of interest there's no doubt about that that's really cool uh i uh would love to see at the end of the year like the lists of different books that you've been able to work with and say you would have never probably had that experience with those books had you not been providing editing and proofreading and book doctoring and coaching and everything oh yeah you know and the, it's just so fun because i love reading anyway um, I laugh and cry with these with these authors. I mean, their stories really touch me. Uh, Amber uh, Furman was one whose book is just so doggone inspirational. Mm -hmm. And uh, I laughed and cried with her. Um, he Helen Bullen, when she wrote her book about having cancer, I laughed and I cried with her too. And uh, how, how much more fun can you have than that? I mean, it's just it's just so interesting and fun to get into these different books. Yeah, I made Jen cry. Oh, Jen. <laughs> oh, look at him laughing. He's laughing at me, friend. I no, felt bad. Even, that's not even nice. I felt bad, but I kind of was proud. <laughs> it's so bad. Naughty Fiction for the Win. Was that her too? I don't know. It might have been. So it may funny. have been. It may have Naughty been her. Fiction for the Win. Yes, it it's may have been on Ray. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> Could be. I'm I'm completely assuming that there's Reveal no name yourselves, on this. Please. <laughs> yes. I know that the crying part was not Honoré. I've never made Honoré cry. Oh yeah, yeah. She know, <laughs> but she sure would laugh at you. Yeah, she's laughed at me plenty of times. Um, <laughs> Jen. Yeah, there you go. There was Jen. <laughs> so uh, for those that, and I won't, I won't like pitch my fiction book here, but I, I wrote a fiction book that deals with child loss and. Um, I wrote it through the perspective of a mother, it, the, the first person character, the main character is the mother. And so um, having a mother proofread it, 
was a little bit of a plan for me. I was like, okay, because my wife is like basically one of my developmental editors. She helps me while I'm writing. Um, oh, so Honoré said the oh, was naughty Honoré fiction for the win. The naughty fiction for the win. Ah. <laughs> she owned up to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when Jen proofread it, I was secretly like, hey, have fun with this book. And I was thinking, okay, I'm going to have a proofreader that's a, a mom. And my Good editor thinking. was a guy. Right. So I wanted to see how that conveyed to a female writer and a mother um, who would be reading this book. So anyways, mission successful. <laughs> well, she was a fantastic proofreader and, and uh, certainly would be good for anybody looking for one, for sure. That's right. And so she, she worked with you on your, um, on your beta program. Yes, she um, did. And yes, so... What happens after an experience like that, where you learn from someone or learn with someone like yourself um, and you form that relationship and you now have those tools to succeed? What is life like after that kind of program? You mean for the student? For yes. the mentee? Oh, well, it's just exactly what she stepped into. Now she's doing some proofreading jobs. So it's um, pretty quick. It, it was, well, if you, if you have the capability of learning right. the skills, it's something that you can do pretty quick. Right. So... Um, you know, and, and let's face it, the more practice you do of anything, the better you're going to get. That's right. And um, she's so willing and, and so capable that um, she's going to do really well. <laughs> so she's she's over here. Thank uh, you. <laughs> see how sweet she is. She really is. You That's know, all was, you, girlfriend. Yeah, she, she was really, really good to work with. Um, and... Um, like you said, great attention to detail on the mechanics in the book. Yeah. That's the one thing I worried the most about on the proofread, to be honest, is, yeah. um, you know, things like that slipping through. I, I, will, I will keep the author's name uh, close because I feel bad for this person, but they're a, they're a New York Times bestselling author. They are a force in their genre. They have done all the things. If you go to a Barnes and Noble, you will see an entire shelf of books dedicated to this author and i've had a chance to to meet them and talk with them um and it's in the fiction space and before i met them i had read several of their novels and i was really excited at the opportunity to discuss some of their characters with them because i was like oh this one character was driving me nuts and i gotta give you give you a, a, an earful on this but the thing I, I felt bad for them was when i was reading these books i saw very clear mechanical errors you know, like very fundamental failures in the editing of the book. And I knew that that author had nothing to do with those failures besides, you know, initially drafting them. And because they're a traditionally published author, they have less control over the editing process, the product that's put out onto the streets, all those types of things. Not to hit traditional publishers, uh, there are plenty of books on both sides of the fence in publishing that are great or not. Um, but I felt bad for this person because... Uh, their proofreader did not do their job and their editor uh, clearly missed some, some very uh, key fundamental elements of line editing. So that I've just, it just jumps off as, as a quality issue to me um, that is inexcusable, whether you're self-published or traditionally published. It's, it's, it's the responsibility of, of the, of the person putting the book out into the world, whether it be a traditional public house, publishing house or an indie publisher, to make sure that that work is done. And um, it's a reflection, of course, from the reader who's not a writer, who doesn't understand the publishing world. It's a reflection on the author. Yes. So if you're the writer, you've got to, and you have the responsibility and the ability to control this, I think you have to. It's non-negotiable. You know, it's such a shame because um, there really is no need for that. And where I was making the point before, I'll make it once again, because I think it's important where the difference between fiction and nonfiction in, in terms of content and having a content editor, um, there are two different skill levels, but a proofreader can do either mm -hmm. because a good proofreader is looking for mechanical and grammar is grammar, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction. So um, there really is no, no excuse not to find a good proofreader. Yeah. Well, can I ask you the most riveting and con like may this might be the sexiest question related to editing and proofreading? Oh boy! Are you ready? I'm ready. Talk to me about that Chicago Manual style. Is oh, this the? <laughs> you no, know, the thing is so big and thick that you could 
use it as a weapon if you decided to throw it at somebody. <laughs> I mean, the thing is huge. So what typically happens is when you're trying to find something, when you really have a question, um, sometimes it's a little difficult. Yeah. Sometimes, And I'm finding uh, just from something that happened recently that I'm still learning some things that I thought that I knew. Mm. And, um, you know, you don't you don't stop learning no matter what. I mean, it's it's funny working, moving from the academic field into, you know, we're working in government first, then publishing in academics where I had to follow a different standard. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. And then moving over to, uh, you know, the fiction and nonfiction worlds outside of academics. It was interesting to me that we were, you know, moving toward Chicago. Um, and I was like, oh, cool what is this like for my editor? Do they have this massive reference? You know, it's obviously online. Um, but how, how is that? Like if that, I mean, you become very intimate with your standard, right? You do. But you know, there's one thing that I always tell um, my student editors, the manual of style is just that it is a style. It is a recommendation. There are no rules. The rules are really, coming from your author. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, the Chicago Manual of Style has a, a way to, to do an ellipsis. Um, <laughs> we talked about this recently. <laughs> That's say, but a lot I, of I never authors don't like that dot space dot. It looks, it looks odd to them and they want to do the dot, dot, dot. I did an entire manuscript where I changed that and the author hated it and changed it all back. Mm. And that's okay. The Chicago Manual of Style police are not going to come and arrest you if you don't follow their style and they're not really rules, their style, as long as it's consistent. What right. you don't want is to have it one way in one section of the book and in another, do it completely different. That's what is really important. And that's what a good proofreader is looking for. That's excellent. Yeah, because I mean, I uh, was using a lot of dialogue in my recent uh, publication that Jen was proofing. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was doing a lot of like contentious discussion in these dialogues between people that were like changing their minds or holding their tongues or cutting each other off. And, and so I had ellipses everywhere. Like, and uh, yeah, no. poor, yeah, poor Jen was like, <laughs> so, the, the funny part to me before I handed the manuscript over was um, I had had the same experience, you know, going through it after I wrote it. I'm like, oh, God, I, I got to standardize all these. I got to get rid of some of these. Like, I got to do something with this. And I wrote a note like, ah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure it out because I didn't get a clear answer online, you know? Yeah, that's the problem mm -hmm. with uh, some of these uh, styles, uh, manual of styles is that you cannot always find without really spending a considerable amount of time uh, doing your research. And sometimes you're going to miss things. Right. Sometimes you're going to learn something brand new later on, which is what I did this past week. So, you know, it's you, you just try to be consistent and do the best you can. I love it. Um, so before we go, obviously, if anyone's got any questions for Karen, please drop them in the chat. Um, we'd love to answer them for you before we drop off here in a couple minutes. Um, but, uh, while, while people are considering that, um, tell us a little bit about where we can get in contact with you, whether it be for editing and, and proofreading services or for education and mentorship. Well, you can go to my website for sure. Uh, Karen Hunsinger.com. If you want to drop me an email, it's Hunsinger at msn.com. And I always answer those. I'm always happy to answer them. Um, I'm not going to be doing another class for a few weeks yet but I'm happy to send the quiz out to anybody who is thinking about uh, becoming an editor. Um, send me an email and I will answer you back happily with that quiz so that you can determine what your skill level is and where you fit in. Oh, thank you. I think this is Jen, maybe. Thank, thank you, you, Jen. I appreciate that very much. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, check the show notes, guys. You can see a link to Karen's site. Um, Karen, your your program, uh, the next run of it, have you decided whether you're going to keep it as a four week pro program or extended? No, I got so much, so much pushback on that. Uh, in fact, they wanted eight. I think that I am settling on six. Okay. Then I will do a six week program. The next Excellent. Week. And what's the uh, weekly commitment like? It's I'm going to be doing it on Saturday. Last time I did it on a Sunday morning, but 
Um, I missed a lot of my church going uh, friends. And so I think I'm gonna do it on a Saturday morning to try to capture those people who, who uh, can't make the other hours, you know, working or whatever, um, and try to accommodate a few more people. So. Excellent. Excellent. And is that uh, a certain amount of time each Saturday? It's going to be an hour on Saturday morning, uh, generally about uh, 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock Central Time, you know, depending on how many of my Pacific Coast uh, peeps I get who have interest in, in it, but um, right around there so that it's not an all-day commitment. And I give a lot of homework. I, I can tell you that. There's a lot of practice work um, and then a lot of discussion about the reading material when we do meet. So Excellent. it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. Jen was one of my best students. She asked the best questions, the best. So I'm not surprised that it. she's like jumping into it because she's very good. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, guys, if you want, go ahead and connect with Karen, which I know you want to do. You should just go do it. Don't even wait. Um, and you can find her at karenhunsanger.com and then you can reach out to her. It's karen at karenhunsanger.msn. Well, it's hunsanger at msn.com. Hunsanger. Gotcha. Hunsanger at msn.com. And guys, that's with an A, not an I. Yes. <laughs> he's saying this because he spelled it wrong. A lot of people spell it wrong. Don't feel bad. You know what it's like to make an error like that with your editor's name? And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then they come back like, hey, dude. <laughs> your fee is double next time. Because right. obviously you need to be watched closely. It, it's, it's bad enough you're doing it to a friend, but you're also doing it to your editor. Who's <laughs> like, look, I already have enough trouble from you with the words that aren't related to me. Yeah, I have to butcher my last name. So... Well, thank you so much for spending your time with us uh, today, Karen, and for sharing all of your great um, insight into you know what it's like to step into the world of editing and proofreading. Um, I was so thrilled to have you with me today, and I know Honoré is obviously appreciative that you were available, and um, I think it made it a much better episode because otherwise, you guys would have just been stuck with me <laughs> talking about course pricing, and no one wants that. So it was so much fun, and I hope I hear from people. I would love to. Yes. So please reach out to Karen and um, we'll see you guys uh, next Thursday. Same bat time, same bat channel. You guys make sure you subscribe to the show. Um, check us out on YouTube and uh, keep your eyes peeled here on Facebook and LinkedIn for next week's notification of live stuff, all the live fun. So, okay, guys, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much. And we'll Bye, see everybody. everybody next week.